When I was younger, my path led me to writing. I started writing in about third grade, and then in fourth grade, I got really into writing tales from the crypt stories because my parents finally let me watch an episode. <laughs> in eighth grade, I wrote my first novel, and by then, I had actually watched a lot of TV and movies. Uh, my first novel was a science fiction story about a diabolical bike race put on by an eccentric billionaire on his private island, where these mechanical balls with gnashing teeth would shoot up through the ground and tear the riders to bits if they fell below a certain speed. So. You can really feel the influence from movies like Speed. <laughs> also in eighth grade, I got really into making amateur short films.、Uh, my parents bought the family a camcorder, and so my friends and I started making these little home movies, complete with scripts and props and everything. And then, when I went to high school, I had the privilege of going to Tempe High in Arizona, and they had this amazing television production program. We even had this little TV studio where we would shoot the daily televised announcements. So by that time, I was making all sorts of short films: personal films, fake commercials, videos for the football team, videos for the student council—you name it. It was—it <coughs> was my calling. Then immediately after high school, I graduated, and then I moved out to Pasadena to live with my granddad and be near Los Angeles, the film capital of the world.、Uh, I went to City College up there for about a week before dropping out. Partially because they wouldn't let me skip beginning film production, which I was already really familiar with, and also because I found out I could jump right into the film industry as a PA. So I did that, but through a series of serendipitous events, I was promoted to an electric on my first day on the job.、Um, but that's a different story for another time. <laughs> It wasn't long until I found work as a gaffer, and I even had a brief stint as an editor. And I mean, I was living the life, right? I was working in Hollywood. I was making movies. I was part of a creative process. It was great. But then, after a while, something didn't feel quite right. I was getting tired of the lengthy schedules and the long commutes. And what's worse is, I started to grow weary of the filmmaking process itself, which isn't a good thing if you want to be a filmmaker. So I left LA, moved to Long Beach, and enrolled at LBCC. You know, just to get my GEs out of the way. You know how they say, like, go to school, get your GEs out of the way, see what happens. So I did that. <laughs> I did that, and then I moved up to San Francisco. And this is back when it was more affordable and cleaner. And I enrolled at City College of San Francisco as a film major. Now that was kind of a convenient choice because I thought maybe I was just in a slump. Maybe now that I'd taken a couple of years off of making films, I'd be ready to jump right back in with a renewed passion. Well, that semester was a rude reminder that I just didn't want to be a filmmaker anymore. My passion was non-existent, and I really didn't know what to do. I mean, what was I going to do? By that point, I had spent a third of my life studying film and trying to be a filmmaker, and now it was just inescapable that I didn't want to make films anymore. So I felt really lost, and I got pretty depressed. But I pushed through, and I transferred to San Francisco State University, and I considered pursuing some kind of a science degree because I'd always liked science and science fiction. But here's the kicker: I absolutely loathed math. I hated math with a passion. I used to give my high school algebra teacher hell about math. I was like, "This doesn't make any sense, and it only makes sense if you just believe it to be true." Blah blah blah. <laughs> In fact, the only reason I passed algebra two is because my friends and I made a movie for our final class project. It was called Indiana Cones: The Search for the Lost Conic. <laughs> it had it had almost nothing to do with math at all, but we did flash the formulas for the conic sections on the screen for about five seconds. I guess that was enough to bump me up to a C. And then, actually, in fact, I had to retake the equivalent of algebra two when I started at LBCC all those years ago. That's how far behind I was. Then I took college algebra, and then I took pre-calculus at San Francisco State. Now that semester, my professor, Dr. Axler, who's amazing by the way, you might know him,、uh, he was writing a pre-calculus textbook, and he implored us to read the book, in part because it was the book we were using for the course, and. He also wanted to know if there were any typos, and there were, and I found a lot of them. <laughs> I think、uh, I think that was my real motivation to read was to find the typos. But for the first time in my life, I started reading my math textbook, and surprisingly, I started to get better at math. It was actually kind of fun to do, and things were starting to click. 
And that semester, I actually got my first A in a math class ever. And Dr. Axler recommended that I take Calculus I in the summer. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, no, this, this A was a one-time stroke of luck for sure. I mean, I'm terrible at math. I've always been terrible at math. And now here's my professor telling me to take calculus in the summer? So I took Calc 1 that summer. And that was the summer that I fell in love with math. The following semester, I decided to major in math. And then I went on to get my BS in applied math and my MS in pure math. And now I'm an instructor here at Cal State Long Beach and at LBCC. Thanks. But, but, but wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How does that make any sense? Like, I hated math. I hated math. I was a writer. I was a filmmaker. I was an artiste. Why math all of a sudden? Well, it turns out that the more revealing question is actually, why writing? Or why filmmaking? I fell in love with math that summer because I saw for the first time just how robust math actually is at describing things. I always thought math was very arbitrary and rigid and limited and couldn't really describe much. But then, in the first week of Calc 1, we started talking about infinity. And I was like, what? <laughs> infinity? I love infinity. I've been thinking about infinity for years and writing about infinity for years. And then what was even better is we started to use infinity to discover new things. And then later on down the line, when I got to real analysis, I was like, holy crap. And I had this epiphany. I realized that I wrote because I liked to communicate and share with others what I perceived about the world. I mean, that's not that far-fetched, right? I saw things and I wanted to share them with others. And then the transition from writing to film makes sense because film is a more effective method of communication. I mean, writing is just words, but films have words, pictures that move, sound, lighting, editing, acting, all these things to make it more effective, right? So if it was so effective, why did I abandon it? Well, it's funny because to see the origin of that dilemma, we actually have to go back to when I was in high school. So back in high school, my friends and I made a film that we were going to submit to a local film festival. Uh, I wrote and directed it, and I gave it the pithy title, Transcending Cinema. And it was a movie about how films had the power to affect change in a person's life. Get it? Transcending Cinema? <laughs> anyway. So we, we finished it, and we screened it to about 30 students, and they really liked it. I mean, they really liked it. Some students were leaving the screening in tears because it touched them so deeply, and I felt like I had really accomplished my goal with this film. But then afterward, when I asked them what they thought the film was about, virtually everyone said, teen angst. <laughs> what? No, 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 this movie's not about teen angst. This is about how movies affect people. I mean, there were those kids in the first half watching the staticky TV screen, and then they all made major life changes in the second half. I mean, wasn't it obvious? Anyway, after that, I actually thought I had kind of failed, but I just kind of shrugged it off and thought, you know, maybe I just didn't make the movie well enough. But later on in my life, when I was ruminating about why I didn't want to be a filmmaker anymore, I realized that I would never be able to make a movie that perfectly communicates the complex ideas that I find fascinating. I was coming to terms with the subjective nature of art. Art lacks objectivity most of the time, and no matter what I said or how I said it, using film, somebody could and would perceive an entirely different idea than the one I was trying to communicate. And I really didn't like that. Now, just, just for the record, I'm not trying to lambast the subjectivity of art or anything like that. I love art, I still make art, and if you want to get meta, technically this talk is an act of artistic creation, but I have no idea if you all are going to understand what I'm trying to communicate up here. <laughs> so, that subjectivity just wasn't sufficient for me. And that is why I had grown weary of the filmmaking process. All of that work to make a movie just didn't seem worth it to me anymore if somebody was going to completely misinterpret my art. I realized I was looking for a language. I was looking for a particular voice. I wanted to be able to speak perfectly clearly with others with zero loss in translation. When I spoke about a thing, I didn't want anybody to be able to perceive it any differently than the way I was trying to communicate it. You know, I'm talking about this, not that. Well. That was the truth about myself that it took me a lifetime of exploration to discover. 
I mean, I think we've all felt the frustration that comes along with really trying to communicate clearly with others, right? Whether it be about something objective like directions to the store or something virtually indescribable like love. Well, for me, that frustration turned out to be very acute and very subconscious. Math was the language I was looking for. Math is a language that we use to describe ideas and communicate about them with others. But here's the best part. Math is the only language humans have ever developed that has the ability to communicate an idea with perfect fidelity. And it's rigorous, it's precise, it's logical, and anybody can do it, completely regardless of ethnicity, nationality, ability, sex, gender, height, weight, favorite food, favorite color, all of that. Mathematics transcends all of those things and makes, it gives, gives a person the ability to communicate with another in a perfectly clear, objective way. And because of that, it allows us as human beings to dig deep into the complexities of reality and the imagination and make the ideas there universally communicable. I mean, that's, that's an amazing ability for a sentient creature to have. You know, like, <laughs> it's just such an amazing thing. And the best part is, once you can read and write and speak the language of math, it reveals these mind-melting truths about reality and, and our existence in general. Here, here's one of my favorite examples, okay? The set of rational numbers has measure zero. Got it? Okay. No, so what that means is, if I were to take a bowl and put all of the real numbers in that bowl and ask you to pick one out at random, there's a 0% chance that you would pick out an, a, a rational number like two or three-fourths, or 17.8888888. But that means there's a 100% chance that you would pick out an irrational number, like pi, or e, or the square root of two, you know, one of those funky numbers. So in essence, the irrational numbers, numbers that can't be written as a ratio of two integers, they make up all the weight of the real line. Now, what's fascinating about that, or disturbing, depending on how you look at it, is that all of the numbers we use in our daily lives are rational numbers. Think about any number that you use when you talk about time or length or money or anything like that. It's a rational number. Even computers cannot conceive of irrational numbers because they have to terminate their processes. So when you hit that button on your calculator, the pi button, and it spits out that number on your screen, that number is not pi. That's a rational approximation of pi. What your calculator does is it stops computing pi at a certain point and cuts off the infinitude of decimal places down the line. But doing that makes the result a rational number. So, all of the numbers that you and I use in our daily lives, all the numbers that we use to develop all the amazing technology we surround ourselves with, is based on a set of numbers that is so small that it comprises virtually none of the numbers that actually exist. That's what we build our world on, that tiny little bit. Anyway, people are usually surprised when I tell them that I used to be a writer and a filmmaker, but I think now you might be able to see that that transition does make sense. I mean, I didn't really know what path I was on. I was just kind of following my gut. Writing satiated me for a while, but ultimately it left me feeling empty. Filmmaking was kind of the same, and then math came along and gave me everything that I wanted. A beautiful language, a robust language with perfect fidelity. But <laughs> in all of those years, when I was writing those books or making those movies, never did I think I would end up becoming a mathematician or a math teacher. But now my career is more fulfilling than anything I could have asked for. I mean, my days are literally spent teaching this language to others and just trying to show them how beautiful and awe-inspiring and scintillating it is. And what's funny is uh, my colleagues will tease me sometimes because I talk about the narrative in a math course. A math course is like a story. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. It, it has plot lines, it has recurring characters and cameos and historical context and Easter eggs, all these things. But just like any story, you have to read it from the beginning through the middle to the end if you want to understand the ending. That's why people find math so difficult. It's accumulative. If you don't understand how to do algebra, it's going to be really, really hard to understand how to do calculus. It's accumulative. I mean, that's like jumping into Game of Thrones after the Red Wedding without having watched the previous seasons. You're going to be confused and lost and wondering why everyone's so sad and angry. That's what math classes are like, you know? <laughs> um, so, 
looking back, I realize I've always been on the right path or some kind of a path. I was just in the wrong lane. I didn't abandon writing or film. I changed media. I changed lanes. Same path, different lane. I'd say I upgraded personally. I mean, writing was getting me about where I wanted to go, but it was like driving on the 110. It was bumpy as hell the whole time along. So I changed lanes and got into a smoother one. And this lane, film, was pretty good, but there were these potholes that would pop up and just rock the entire vehicle suddenly, unexpectedly. Then I just kind of drifted around wondering where I was going to find a smooth lane until I found and was gently guided to this super smooth, wide open lane, math. A lane like the Phoenix freeways. I don't know if you've driven on the Phoenix freeways, but they're huge and they're really smooth. <laughs> but the best part is this lane, math, is as wide as the universe itself. And it's been a smooth drive ever since. So the lesson that I learned is that we can be drawn to something without understanding why. And we can abandon something without understanding why. But there's this kernel of truth, like a filament winding through your life, connecting all of these feelings together. And once you can see it, it illuminates everything in the past and shines a light down the tunnel of the future. But that filament may be very subtle and very complex. I mean, do you ever feel sometimes like your path is broken or discordant or doesn't make sense sometimes? Well, I, I urge you, try to find that filament. Go somewhere tonight to a comfortable place and see if you can catch just a glint of it it might be in your career. It might be in your relationship or your politics or your morals or your religion. It might even be in an unexpected place like the city in which you live or the type of toothpaste that you like to use. Maybe your favorite pair of socks. You might already be on the right path, but just in the wrong lane. So drive safely, everyone. And thank you for listening. I hope it made sense. Thank you.